Well, good morning. I thank you for your continual patience and understanding uh, related to our wanting to meet outside, but it was just so incredibly humid uh, this Sunday morning, and uh, the strain that puts on our setup team, our worship team, and all of you, we just felt like uh, it, it just wasn't worth it to try and and do that uh, under these kinds of weather conditions. Hopefully next week will be better and we can enjoy ourselves outside again. Um, let's just keep continuing to pray for each other during this time, uh, that God will continue to protect us, help us, heal us during this pandemic, to sort out and work out for us all the details of life related to jobs, to school, uh, to all the questions we have about how life is going to go forth uh, in the coming weeks and months. I know there's just a lot of uncertainty, but we can be certain of this. God is good, that he loves us, that his plan for us is to build us up, encourage us in the faith, strengthen us, and lead us to a place of being able to stand. Let's trust him for that, shall we? Uh, I encourage you now to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 14. We'll begin reading in verse 8. In Lystra there was a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking, and Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed. And he called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed into the crowd shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without a testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Father, we ask you this morning that you would speak to us from your word into our lives, the lives that we live in metropolitan St. Louis, in West County, the jobs that we have here, the families that you've placed us in, the neighborhoods. Speak to us, Lord, in the real place where we are living with real truth that will really change us. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me start by asking you a question. Do you know what a docent is? Here in the United States, docent is a title for a guide at a museum, an institution, or a monument, whose job is to provide information, observations, and education for those visiting. Now, frequently they are volunteers, but all of them have spent considerable time in the museum or historical site, becoming immensely familiar with the exhibits, the background, and the minute details of the place. We see the museum with our own eyes, but also through their eyes as well. I love docents. If I had time and availability, I would love to be a docent at the Science Center or the old courthouse or, or the History Museum. Gavin and I went to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum in Springfield last year, and having a docent during part of the visit made it so much more interesting. She pointed out little things in the exhibits that we would not have likely noticed, but were very meaningful and important. And some years ago, our family toured the National Museum of the United States the Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. And we were on a very tight schedule, so we skipped the tour and just wandered around. I know we missed so much as a result of not having a docent. It occurred to me 
that those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, his contemporary disciples, have a calling to serve as docents, not of museums or exhibits, but docents of God's grace. Our mission is that others can see with their own eyes what we have been trained to see with ours. In our passage in Acts that we just read in Acts 14, shows the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, acting as docents of grace. Remember, it began this way. In Lystra there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking, and Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had faith to be healed and called out, Stand on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw that Paul had, what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lycaonian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. So that's the setup. That's what's happening here. There's this miracle that's taken place. And, and, we, and we know it's a miracle because Dr. Luke, who, write, who wrote Acts, is very precise in the description of what he saw here. And what we can derive from the passage, what he tells us is that this man suffered from a congenital birth defect, maybe something like cerebral palsy. He's very precise in his descriptions. Now, Paul and Barnabas, we're told just before this, were preaching the gospel there. Uh, literally, it says they were good newsing the city. And it says in verse 9 that this man listened to Paul as he was speaking. So he's hearing a gospel message. And it says Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed. And that word healed is the exact same word as the word saved. They're used interchangeably. So what's going on here is this. Paul discerns that the Holy Spirit is going to perform an authenticating miracle that frequently accompanied gospel preaching especially in areas previously unreached. Seeing that this is going to happen, he commands the man to stand. The man leaps up and begins to walk around. Now listen, he was this way from birth, and now he's walking around. No rehab, no toddler walking and falling and walking again. He's got moves like Jagger. The Lystrian worldview, the view of these people who lived in this town, What's that like? Well, we see what happens there. They look at Paul and Barnabas and they say, Oh, look, they are gods. Let's kill some bulls for them. That's their worldview, that these, the gods had come and done this miracle for this man. Paul and Barnabas, though, they have another worldview. We can call it the apostolic worldview. It says this, But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We're bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Notice that repentance, turning from, that, that, that the apostles preached to these people, includes, involves abandoning a worldview inconsistent with the character of the one true God. Now, this is important. The Greek and Roman gods were unpredictable, inscrutable, emotion-driven, and ultimately they were false and trivial gods. And among the Greeks and Romans, it was particularly difficult to discern what would please the gods. Paul says, that's worthless. These gods are worthless. And now, though, they turn into docents. They point out in the exhibit of reality who God is and what he's really like. In verse 15, they say he is the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. He's the creator. They would understand this, that what you make if you're the creator, if you make something, what you make is what you rule, and what you make is also what you care for. They go on. They say, in the past, 
God let all the nations go their own way. Now, what they're saying is that though he's impugned and offended by sinners in the world, he's extended patience to those who have lived their lives without acknowledging him. He continues in verse 17. Yet, God has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. You see, what the apostles are doing here is they're making a distinction. The one true God is not unpredictable, inscrutable, emotion-driven, and certainly not trivial. The true God, well, he has a testimony. He's on the record. Kindness, provision, rain, crops, plenty, and joy. This is what he does. This is what he provides. This tells us something about who he is. Now these details may have been overlooked, unnoticed, even ignored by their hearers, but the apostles are pointing them out so they can turn to God as he is. As they're preaching the gospel, they're trusting that these people are being persuaded to turn to a God who is good and generous and genial. My friends, let's take a lesson from all this. This is very good practical theology. Now, we know what the core of the gospel is, right? The core of the gospel. There was a good creation. God did it. He made it. And he called it good. In the creation were our first parents who lived in this Garden of Eden, the Garden of Paradise, they were given abundant blessing, provision, and even the presence of God. With one prohibition, they were not to eat the fruit from one tree in the garden. What takes place? An intentional, willful fall from faithfulness to God, a falling into sin that not only wrecked their personal lives, but the lives of all of their offspring for all generations and wrecked even the world itself. So there's creation, then there's the fall. But there, even in the garden, as God pronounces curse and consequence because of sin, there's also a promise that he will send one who will come to undo this work. It's the promise of redemption, promised by God, by God in the garden and fulfilled by God through sending his son Jesus to die on a cross for the sins of of the whole world. And the final aspect of the core of the gospel is renewal. That those who come to trust Christ in this life, that God begins a new thing in them, making them new creations. They become new creations. Their lives begin to change and transform and, and their desires change as well and become more and more Christ-like. Christ Ultimately leading to the end of time where there's a new heaven and a new earth. That's the core of the gospel. The sphere of the gospel though, is that since God is everywhere, we need to look for signs of him. There are two distinct types of grace in this gospel presentation. Two distinct types of grace. Grace is unearned a favor from God. Now, as believers, we are recipients and then ambassadors and proclaimers of God's saving grace. It's found in the work of Jesus on the cross. It's born out of a heart of love in our own God. And this grace that saves us, forgives us our sins, and brings us to faith in Christ. It unites us to Jesus and adopts us into his forever family. This saving grace is continually applied by the Holy Spirit through the word of God to change us into becoming more obedient, Christ-like people until we are summoned home by death or see Christ face to face at his return. The as yet unconverted... They have no personal experience of this saving grace. They are, in fact, unsaved. And the good news of God's saving grace, when it is presented to the unconverted by the working of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, people indeed do repent from their sins and receive God's mercy. 
That's saving grace. However, there's another distinct type of God's grace that both Christ followers and the rest of the world may experience. It's not saving grace. It's called common grace. A grace or expression of divine goodness and favor that's universal, hence the word common. All mankind are the recipients of this outpouring of God's grace. Not everybody experiences it in the same degree or in the same manner. And our use of the term common does not mean in the same measure for all. It means universal. It's extended to everyone. But it doesn't also mean that it's mundane. Though common grace is often taken for granted and, and detached from its source, who is God. But it's anything but dull and ordinary. It is seen in bountiful fields, in medical advancements, in artistic genius, in loving families, in getting global initiatives for the provision of clean water and nutritious food and civil liberty and much more. And this, this common grace, is what the apostles are referencing in verse 17. It says, yet he has not left himself without testimony. God hasn't left himself without a testimony. He's shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. What are they talking about here? They're talking about common grace. They're being docents of this grace. Theologian John Murray defines common grace this way. Common grace, he writes, is every favor of whatever kind or degree falling short of salvation, which this undeserving and sin-cursed world enjoys at the hand of God. Yes, the world has fallen. It's under a curse because of sin. And the evidence of that is everywhere. In nature, we find disease and drought, famine, natural disaster, COVID-19 and murder hornets. Among the mankind, we find violence, cruelty, cowardice, betrayal, selfishness and partiality. However, because God is good, as well as he is just, his goodness extends to his creation and his creatures despite the curse. Back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, at the conclusion of his creative six days, it says, God saw all that he made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And we still see that in creation today. We see this common grace of God in the sunrises and sunsets, in mountain vistas, canyons and valleys, prairies and deserts, oceans and streams. The Hubble brings to our eyes such wonders in the galaxy. And an electron microscope brings to our eyes such wonders in a single cell. On our trip to Michigan through Illinois and Indiana, just recently as we drove, we saw miles and miles of acres and acres of soybeans, corn, cherries, blueberries, and apples. My damaged heart was surgically repaired, and along with medication created by the genius of scientists and researchers, these have given me a strength and a vitality I hadn't known for 10 or more years. I dare not suppose that all of these people who provided all of this are saved, nor are the recipients of their insight, skill, and labor all saved souls either. Women and men have done and continue to do heroic and sacrificial things for the sake of others and to make the world better. Not all of them, perhaps not many of them, acknowledge Jesus as Savior and Lord, but they have done much good, great good. This is common grace, and the world is full of it. Common grace restrains evil impulses from their full expression. Yes, all of us, all humans are sinners. But common grace restrains many of us from descending into the depths of evil activity. We're not as bad as we could be, are we? Common grace restrains us from that. Common grace causes the development of human government and justice systems. Yes, they are flawed because flawed people serve in them. But as Paul points out in Romans 13, for the one in authority 
This is in verse 4 of Romans 13. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. If you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They're God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. As believers, we're called to be docents of this grace. We have to study and search for it ourselves. And then with joy and eagerness, point it out to others. It presents a testimony the world needs to hear, today especially. It's a testimony of hope, a testimony of expectation. And it leads to thanksgiving and gratitude, something of woefully short supply these days. The apostolic preaching of the gospel was shot through with warning. In Acts chapter 2, verse 40, the apostles are preaching, Peter is, and he says, with many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. The gospel and preaching is shot through with warning, but it's also shot through with promise. Acts chapter 3, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. They turn to a God whose character is partly revealed by common grace. Further on in Acts 3, he says, He said to Abraham, Through your offspring, all peoples on the earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. This is a God who is calling to us. And we see his character by common grace. He's calling to us to take care of us, to care for us, and to bless us. And when we point out common grace whenever we see it, when we're docents of this grace, people see God in his character. In part, they see who he is. And the Holy Spirit uses that to bring them all the way home. Make a commitment today to be both a herald of the gospel and a docent of God's common grace on permanent exhibition in your personal part of the world. Be an expert for your sake and for the sake of the yet unfound. Be a docent of God's grace. Let's pray. Father, for many of us, this is a challenge to even consider how much we have ignored, not taken into account the various expressions of your grace all around us. We can kind of tell that we've become that way because, well, we're irritable and crabby. We're negative and down. You're going to help us with that because you love us. But part of the way you're helping with us with that by telling us to open our eyes and see your hand of goodness and blessing in the world around us, to see your grandeur in creation, to see your love expressed in so many ways as people get helped and healed medically, as provision is made for those who hunger and thirst in this world, as we see good people doing good things for good purposes, and behind that we know, Lord, is you, our, our good God. Open our eyes, Lord, to see these aspects of common grace. And then, Lord, give us the capacity and the wisdom to begin to speak of such things in conversations with others. That we can, in fact, be, Lord, those who bring a blessing by speaking of your goodness and generous nature your care, concern, and compassion, because it's everywhere and it's all around us. The evidences of your good hand in your good creation still, even in the midst of this very fallen world. Help us understand that. Help us execute that, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time.